Greetings, everybody, and welcome to my three-part fan commentary on the end of the journey for Power Rangers Lost Galaxy, part one of Journey's End. At the time of this video's recording, it has been over 25 years since Power Rangers Lost Galaxy ended. So to coincide with the 25th anniversary, I decided to go ahead and do these episodes in recording um, ahead of time before the actual date of the anniversary is coincide, coinciding December the 18th of 2024, which is 25 years since uh, the final episode of the series ended, you know, had aired and ended not only that, but Power Rangers of the 90s. So, Deviat returns to the Scorpion Stinger, huh? And we had to skip those Captain Mutiny Lost Galaxy episodes, speaking of which, because those episodes were rather underwhelming and pointless. And yeah, there was a good reason I had to skip them, because anybody who's seen the season and anybody who knows about these Power Rangers and anybody who's watched the show throughout the rest of the, <laughs> the entire time, we had to skip those episodes because, well, now we know the only reason those episodes were produced was because the producers and everybody on, on the show's production team had to save money just for these last three episodes because they wanted to give a Lost Galaxy a all-out epic ending that nobody saw coming, even when I was a kid 25 years ago watching it. And now, 25 years later, Journey's End is... A very rather dark ending to a Power Ranger season, and it was probably a dark ending to a Power Ranger series that even I, as a kid at the time, never saw coming either. Because there was a whole lot of stuff about this finale. I feel like Journey's End kind of out-trumped Countdown to Destruction by a mile, given all the things that uh, what Countdown could have been. And it seems like Journey's End is a response to Countdown to Destruction, had if that was a three-part finale to the Zordon era, when Journey's End is basically the three-part ending to not just this season, but the end of Power Rangers throughout the 1990s because this was one of the last few episodes of Power Rangers to air before the turn of the century because, you know, during 1999 and how people was during the end of that year where everybody believed that, you know, the world would come to an end because of that y Y2K thing going on and because they felt that by the year 2000, everything would go straight to hell, as so as we thought. But we already know what would happen come 2001 with the 9-11 attacks, which was during Time Force's run. But you get the idea. But this season was actually a precursor to what would yet to come throughout the post Zordon era. And especially with some of the 9-11 stuff that would also occur because of, you know, Time Force and even this season. And even a little bit of Lightspeed Rescue with any 9-11 imagery of sorts. And speaking of that, even when I remember when I was a teenager still watching Power Rangers, and especially re reruns of my favorite era on the Disney networks like JetX, and whenever JetX did do their Power Rangers Generations block, whenever they did got around Lost Galaxy, they kind of skipped on Journey's End for a particular reason because of some imagery that may too be too close to home to 9-11. Also, when the, when we got to that shot of Trakina laughing at Deviant getting impaled and pummeled by Villamax, that already foreshadowed what kind of insanity would ensue and yet to come. And seeing the two villains merge in the cocoon was probably one of the most interesting, if not boldest, writing decisions. Because given the fact that Trakina and Deviat both had a power struggle thing going on, and I felt like, okay, if she had all this power and I try to get the same power she has, how about we merge the two beings into whole one? And actually, I think this was a whole lot better than what we saw later on with Queen Banshee emerging with Viper at the end of Lightspeed Rescue. But I'm sorry, Banshee. Trakina did it better. I'm sorry. And and even by the by, seeing her merge with Deviat is probably one of the, if not most interesting parts of the season. But I don't know about you guys, but seeing her like this, especially merged with him, is perhaps one of the most freakish, but yet brilliant villain writing moves for Power Rangers, apparently. Yeah, even Villamax is puzzled by this. Yeah, and here we are with the uh, 
the end of the journey because Terra Venture made it so far throughout the whole year. And you know that if you sit through this entire season in one sitting, because especially on the Shout Factory DVDs where it said 15 hours of watching all 45 episodes in one sit setting, technically it doesn't feel like we actually watch a whole year worth of Power Rangers anymore. But back in the day when I was a kid watching this 25 years ago, as well as the other seasons, they technically, well, felt like it was worth a while. But if, well, yeah, back when these shows shows aired we had to wait the next week or even the next day and even back in the time when these episodes would air by the fall of their respective year that they would air all these new episodes within a week and sometimes Saturday mornings depending on where you was and I think that was one of the coolest things about that when watching Power Rangers back then as a kid now with the with the rise of social media with the rise of streaming and Netflix and even with the show now on YouTube which you can watch all full episodes all full length versions of all these old episodes for free on YouTube it's incredible that when you sit through all these episodes in one sitting it doesn't really feel like we actually watched an episode a week we actually watched the whole series as it happened now thanks to streaming and even with YouTube and by the by, in past commentary tracks for some of the episodes for Lost in the Galaxy second half, whenever we saw these people from Terra Venture, especially the staff there, that old man that I kept seeing, um, Jack Betts, who's the actor who played, uh, I forgot his character name in the series, but you know, again, there's just so many superfluous characters, not Commander Stanton in the show. I've seen this actor in, in between this, you know, between these Power Rangers, he was involved in two other superhero properties during this time. And it's crazy how I've seen the same actor who was, uh, I think, is it Brody? I think or something. This old man, by the way, seen him in Joel Schumacher's two Batman movies and saw him as one of the Oscorp board members in Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man, which is crazy because considering that this was in a time when Saban kind of got some hands on of some of the actors of the Screen Actors Guild to be a part of something non-union like Power Rangers, when we would later see this in later seasons of the post Zordon era, as we shall see, and even in the in the um the Disney seasons, because even in like the cases of Lightspeed Rescue and Time Force and Wild Force with some actors from Screen Actors Guild to be a part of something non-union like this, like get this, even with Lightspeed Rescue's case, the voice actress behind Queen Banshira, Diane Salinger, was it? She has been in a lot of numerous productions that were mainly Screen Actors Guild or so or B grade long before Power Rangers. And even for Time Force's case where you had Vernon Wells and, um, Edward Albert was it who played Mr. Collins Wes's dad um, and they were in numerous stuff well known stuff before Power Rangers and even when we get to Time Force again and whenever I discuss uh, the end of time or any Time Force episode really and I've already discussed some episodes that was centric about Rancic like Fraxis Fury and Rancic Lives earlier if you want to hear those I have those commentary tracks still low on my channel if you're curious Huh, that's funny. Here's a callback to uh, Quasar Quest, where if the fir the show began with Mike and Commander Stanton looking at the at the window through Terra Venture, the show ends with that same similar shot and how far we've come with these characters since the beginning. You know, it's kind of crazy how I felt that Lost Galaxy back then wasn't going to be all that interesting, but here we are. It was a well-made Power Ranger season, and you can see why I loved it for so long for the last 25 years. It took me a long time to get used to everybody on the group, not Leo, but it took me a while to get used to characters like Kai, Maya, Damon, Kendricks. I've always been new about Karon because she was already established last season, previously as Astronema, then she became the Pink Ranger. I know, Maya. I know how much you miss Kendricks. I get it. I know you miss her more than the guys do. You know, it's so funny how, like, this new world, once the characters do get to that world, okay, I know we're going to run into some spoiler territory, but for those who have never seen the season for the first time in 25 years, or if you haven't got through the season before back in the day, you're going to get into some spoiler territory when we get to part three, but I won't spoil it for those who have never seen the season before. But for everybody else who has, including myself, we already know what that planet is as we get close to it.
And just as soon as they get close, it's like, yeah, it's their big day, but then... Yep, we know what's coming. The impending doom. Here we are, everybody. The impending doom that awaits for Terra Venture as it's on its last leg on the colony. And... Things are not looking pretty good, and seeing that green light on Stanton's face already foreshadowed the kind of green we would see Trakina. And it's kind of crazy how they did some really brilliant foreshadowing what is yet to come with the show and as we get to the very dark end of the series. Yeah, you thought y'all lost her too, but no, she decided not to go into the Lost Galaxy and follow y'all because, well, from a writing convenience uh, with the writers, they felt that Trakina following the Rangers into the Lost Galaxy would be too dubious, so it was best to keep the villains away from that and let them handle dealing with being in the Lost Galaxy with all the wasted potential that storyline had in the beginning, and I kind of feel like, yeah, they could have explored and expanded more on why the show is called Lost Galaxy to begin with, because... Well, that's one of the f many controversial and setback things about the show for the last 25 years. And hell, as a grown man, 32 years old here as of this recording, looking back on the season as a 32-year-old man who is not seven years old watching this anymore, I can see why Lost Galaxy had some flack with people is because the title of the show and how much of a dubious lie it was. It's still a cool season of Power Rangers, and I think it did step up against In Space in terms of production quality because, well, In Space's budget, and even though In Space was a great season, but its budget was slashed due to Turbo because Turbo was a really bad season, per se, according to many's belief. But, you know, if, if you thought the mass alien invasion on Earth on Angel Grove was huge, Think about what Trakina did to Terra Venture here. Like, she just destroyed the last remaining engine of the thing. Now, on the Fox Kids promo for the, the finale of Journey's End, when Trakina says the line, nothing can stand, stand away this time, nothing, it was in a totally different pitch, but in the final episode, it's truncated with the more robotic voice to her. So I've noticed that, a difference between the TV promo for this versus the final cut of the episode. And I just never understood why is Trakina going after Damon for some reason. So we got some calling back to Green's, Green Courage a little bit, but I do not want to bring up about Reggie Roll and Amy Miller being a, th being a married couple until, until they're divorced in 2018. Yeah, I understand. After the production on Power Rangers Lost Galaxy wrapped, Reggie and Amy got married, had three kids, and then they divorced sometime in 2018, nearly 20 years after the show was produced. Yeah, I understand. Many will also be puzzled, why did Damon marry Trakina in real life? I know, that's none of my business, N-O-Y-B. Yeah, tell me that, all you want. But, it's a fact. And I knew with Leo and Damon going away from Trakina and this kind of visual imagery just foreshadowed that Power Ranger Super Legends game. Huh, that's funny. And I just beat that game, and although the voice actress behind Trakina on that game was terrible, and I thought the stand-in actress for her in Trakina's revenge was badly acted. Now, this was a really massive, heartbreaking moment to see Terra Venture destroy it like this. And it's crazy. They went all out with this ending. Destroying the colony, the last remaining engine. So the, once, the, once that last engine gets destroyed, the colony dies. This is some dark stuff. Even looking back now, Jesus, 25 years later. I must wonder, I don't know why I never got to see part one earlier on its first airing, but damn, this was brutal. Seeing people flying all over the place, that is some brutal shit for Power Rangers. 
And a lot of people missed out on this stuff 25 years ago. No matter how great Countdown to Destruction was, but this finale was brutal. Like, totally brutal. Yeah, sure, In Space's last few episodes was uh, devastating seeing the last time we'll ever see the Delta Megazord, the Mega Voyager, and they all got blown up and torn to shreds. And then Dark Conda kills Dark Spectre behind his back and everything, and <sighs> Andro shatters Zordon's tube. But I say Lost Galaxy's finale had way more going on for its ending. But I know it's not supposed to outdo Countdown to Destruction. But again, if it weren't for Countdown to Destruction, future Power Rangers series would not do finales as in a similar pattern as Countdown to Destruction. But they had their own ordeal and how they end their seasons and get darker in certain ways. And I mean, as opposed to like some of Super Sentai's earlier seasons, especially the seasons I've watched from that were of the 90s era, especially the Sentai's we did adapt for Power Rangers. And I, when I watched the Endgame arcs for some of those Sentai's like Zoo Ranger, Die Ranger, Kaku Ranger, O Ranger, those endings were rather dark, especially Zoo Ranger and O Ranger's endings and how dark those endings got. But, I mean, Lost Galaxy starting with until, like, very going down the line with seasons like RPM or uh, Operation Overdrive in them and Mystic Force, they would go into a similar pattern how Super Sentai would, end, would have their dark-ass endings until they would go into a much brighter way of ending their shows. But when things get dire and worse, it knows when to get dire and worse and when things get really dramatic. And it was time that we had, starting with this season... And, that Power Rangers needed to go uh, dark with the endings. And even though this may be a, a kids and family show, but they really know how f whoever was the makeup artist that put all the uh, scabs and bruises on everybody on the faces of Terra Ventures colonists did a good job to make it look like they were bruised and injured, but... I know that if Power Rangers wasn't a kid show back in the day, and especially when I was the target demographic for this, I wish they would go further on like the bloodshed, blood cuts, and stuff like that. But of course, this is not Sentai when they would do it, but Power Rangers knows when to do it. But also, got to realize seasons like this was on a local network. So, I mean, again, I wish Power Rangers would have been on Fox, the Fox Family Channel. Um, rather than still on Fox Kids for brand consistency. Because even if you have it on a local network, you could have still, um, on a cable network, you could get away with some stuff like, you know, characters bleeding and stuff like that. And, and even get even further with some of the violence. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Trakina ate one of her relatives. Ugh, yuck. An insect woman eating her own insect relative. Ew. And this is one of the most controversial things about the season finale and still one of the most talked about things about this and the entire franchise 25 or 30 years of Power Rangers later. Trakina putting bombs on Stingwingers and do the most pre-9-11 thing imaginable for a kid show. And... Heck, this is another thing I didn't see coming either. But again, I didn't see part one when it initially broadcast on December the 16th of 99. So it wasn't until later, like sometime in 2000 or whenever Disney started broadcast doing reruns of the previous seasons uh, throughout 2002 to 2007. You know, it's kind of crazy how Trakina has come a long way since she started in the series. She started off as a no fighter for nothing, spoiled princess to now this. And that's quite villain development we all never saw coming. Because again, um, sure, yeah, I mind Astronomer's character development and how she was. But Trakina's character development for a female Power Rangers villain was a unique one. Because we never had this kind of character development for any of the other female villains before her or Astronoma. Well, again, with, with, with Rita and Diva Tox, they were comic relief female villains. Astronomer and Trakina, and even later on with Queen Banshee, were rather um, sympathetic, serious-minded villains. So if you make Trakina a comedic villain, like, let's say, Diva Tox and Rita, we would not see her as an, an opposing threat. But what we saw here, she's really an opposing threat, especially still with the Deviant getup. And I know the Stingwingers was done as CGI, and that's what I'm trying to do in my uh, 
last bit of my fan film reboot before um, I put it out before the uh, 25th anniversary is up. And the scene that shot of Trakina getting all in our faces and seeing how, yeah, what we yet see to come in part two, because we already know what's yet to come in part two, because everybody's seen it. I've seen it. So let's get on with part two anyway, because. Yeah, that's a lot to talk about with this one. Okay, welcome to my fan commentary on part two of Journey's End. And everybody knows about this one because this is the episode that was perhaps the only time we'll have some focus on Villa Max. And as well as the episode where we see the final time we would see the, the original Astro Mega ship getting crushed. And Leo's jet jammer gets damaged temporarily. So, obviously, part two of Journey's End is that one episode of Power Rangers that I think had the heaviest censorship prior to the, you know, reruns of Time Force on Disney networks like Jet X and ABC Family. Because I remember, again, back when I was watching some episodes of Lost in Galaxy on TV on Jet X or, or Power Rangers Generations more rather, they hardly ever did show... Um, part two or actually i think this is probably one reason why jetix didn't want to uh do some reruns of lost galaxy after they get the loss you know in space and then go straight and then they would just simply just go straight to light speed rescue like lost galaxy never happened for some reason what and yeah and seeing the centaurs and stratifors megazords uh being covered by sting wingers yeah it's, it's gonna be sad to see them go too but again, this 9-11 destruction stuff, this is probably why they cut this episode out of circulation. And I think that's probably what got Disney's attention when they were, you know, doing syndication for a lot of these older episodes prior to their seasons and prior to Time Force. So they figured, okay, let's skip Lost Galaxy because there's there was that one episode that was just too much like what happened in 9-11. But again, the season was pr pr produced two years before 9-11 and two years before Time Force was even a thing. So, well, but then again, ever since Time Force existed and then Disney bought Power, had Power Rangers and for a couple years and then we had the, um, the multiple blocks on ABC Family and Jetix and all of that and then... And then you just go straight to just... You know, you had Mighty Morphin through in space, and then you skip this season, then go to Lightspeed Rescue and Time Force and Wild Force, and then on to showing more of your seasons, Disney. Like, really? And oh, yeah, Paul Schreier, Bulk, was featured in the opening credits for this episode, but no Professor Phenomenus, but him and, Bulk, him and Phenomenus was featured in the opening credits for part one of Quasar Quest, though. Like, Really? Oh, there's Bulk and Phenomenus, but again, three of 45 episodes, and you only met one or two of the main cast. I just don't understand what the hell was the point of those two in this episode. You're not going to do Bulk and Skull in this season. God damn. Yeah, I do recall seeing this part as a kid because I remember um, when I was coming back from school one day and during December of 99, I remember when dad did, when my father did tape uh, these last two episodes of these Power Rangers on a new batch of a videotape. I did recall catching parts two and three of Journey's End, but part two especially, seeing the Rangers being underwhelming, underwhelmingly uh, bombarded by Stingwingers with bombs that just... Man, they would have blown up our heroes in the smithereens. And man, I'm telling you, this finale is just like straight up fucked up. Stingwingers trying to blow up our heroes and try to kill them. And like, damn, Trakina is so homicidal and so violent. Who would have thought that she would do something we never saw coming either? And she really gives Astronema a step, for, you know, a run for her money and knowing former Astronema is currently the Pink Ranger here. And she almost, and even, I think even Trakina had those Stingwingers try to blow up Corone. And I guess maybe that was her way of trying to, you know, tell the, the former Astronema to suck it, I guess. Well, that was very heroic of Villa Max, and we didn't expect heroism out of a brainwashed Dark Knight that was honoring his evil queen. Saving that little girl that was almost getting killed by the, the destruction that was seeing her. 
Huh. And also another foreshadowing bit for Trakina's revenge. The little girl thing. Yeah, I'd never really understood. Um, I think when I thought back to Trakina's revenge, there was some calling back to this last bit of the show. Yeah. And the actress who played her mother, though. She looks like one of those former supermodels turned actresses and then gave up after this. Well, you deserve that blue flower villa, Max, only for it to get stepped on later on. It is sad to see the Centaurs and Stratoforce Megazords get wasted. Yeah, even though this is also as to close out the show, they were Deviots, evil Zords that um, were lost Galactabees. So. Trakina destroys what were those lost Galactabees that Deviant enslaved back then, and she just destroys them. I mean, had if Trakina wasn't merged with Deviant, Deviant would have went psycho on his own, and actually, who would have who would have thought? But again, Trakina didn't know nothing about the Cent Centaurs and Stratoforce Megazords beforehand, but she was already aware of the Rangers as Megazord, and also was aware of the stuff they had, but... She didn't know who these Megazords were, so she destroys them. Even Villamax is really in utter dismay. And man, seeing the, seeing the two Megazords being destroyed, I'm already getting PTSD of when the Thunderzords blew up, or when the Mega Voyager got blown up by Tankenstein. And this is even three times worse than when the Rangers lost the Thunderzords and the Mega Voyager. Damn, Trakina, why did you do that? Yeah, rest in peace, Centaurus and Stratoforce. So I think also another theory. With the Centaurus and Stratoforce Megazords discontinued, Zenith Carazor just remained inoperable and just disappeared for no reason. Yeah, they couldn't manage to get the like the toy version and do some cheap green screen of them of it to go to attack the Stingwingers. Even the Stingwingers probably should have destroyed the Zenith Carrier Resort if they could have used that in American footage. Just use the toy version of it and just there you go. That's what they did with season three of Mighty Morphin was just take the toy version of Titanus and merge that with the toy version of the Ninja Megazord in the in the Shogun Megazord and that worked. But they couldn't even bother use the Zenith Carrier Resort toy to use that at least. And but then that would make things look a little bit more cheap and make this look like a toy commercial inspired by another toy commercial or a show that is a toy commercial for 22 minutes, obviously. This is the final time we will see the Stingwingers, so thank God they're gone. Now Trakina has no army, and I guess based on that dialogue alone when she berated Villamax, she don't need an army and she doesn't need anyone. She's damn right about that part. But after she lost the Stingwingers, well, then again, she was still under DVS control, so now she don't have an army to fight the Rangers, so she wasted those foot soldiers at her disposal. Yeah, well, at least Trakina did something that Divatox could never do back in Turbo's finale. The Piranatron still exists, but... Uh, well, then we saw two Piranatrons back in Protect the Quasar Saber at the Onyx Tavern. And how they came back. Yeah, she's she's not she's not uh right in the head. I figured that's one of the reasons why I decided for Power for my Power Rangers Lost Galaxy reboot recently that I wanted to make Trakina just insane naturally without the Deviat stuff because as a callback to her being insane in the finale well the themes of mental illness and all of that uh, comes to play with Trakina and my thing as opposed to Trakina in the main universe here where she was merged with Deviat and she just did all of this stuff she couldn't do when she was just herself so when she took deep when Deviat merged her, her with him he made it possible Again, Balkan Phenomenus, what the fuck are they still doing in the show if they had no purpose in the show without Skull? I just, again, don't get it.
I feel sorry for that woman. She wanted that portrait of her family, so Kai decided to just let her take it. Just leave everything else like clothes and other thing belongings behind because the colony is on the brink of collapse and everybody's going to die without oxygen on the ship because now that the main dome doesn't have any oxygen left and seeing Stanton in sadness. Actually, I think Stanton held this on very well as opposed to in Lightspeed Rescue's finale when uh, Captain Mitchell felt sadness for seeing the aqua base being trashed by the Batlings and Queen Ben Shira's forces. But I kind of feel like Stanton did this better here as opposed to with Mitchell. I'm sorry to say that. And I actually felt that, you know, Commander Stanton was a great ancillary character that wasn't any of the Rangers. And I actually think he has grown on me over time, too, because, you know, every time I look back on the season. And this is our last bit of reconciliation with Mike, uh, Kai and Leo. I was about to say Mike and Leo. I meant Kai and Leo. After all the things they've been through since the start of the show. And basically, I've always said that Kai and Leo have been the uh, Captain Kirk and Spot of Power Rangers for a Red and Blue Ranger. And I think there was another reason I also wanted to adapt this bit for my uh, 2024 P Lost Galaxy fan film reboot is the uh, expand more on Kai and Leo being like Kirk and Spock and given their dynamic and bantering they've been doing. So kudos to that. Well, to me at least. It just goes to show how much I'm passionate about these Power Rangers and how passionate I was for so long, despite the obsession I had for a certain female bug-headed villain who I tried to get in a fan film for 15 years, but after someone from back in the day, on, back in my last year of high school, couldn't play this villain in a fan project, I figured, you know what, I'll just wait six years down the line and try to see if I can try to do her, since no one else could. This moment with Villa Max trying to have a change of heart, yeah, it was rather short lived. And honestly, I kind of think Villa Max could have been saved. He could have been, uh, you know, he could have fought alongside the Rangers uh, to fight her if uh, with no other option. And hell, I even think Kegler could have helped uh, help the Rangers and Villa Max to stop her, but Kegler did nothing. This moment, everybody who's seen this finale, seen this episode in particular, this is a really devastating way to lose a character that I thought we didn't think would go as well. We tried to see, I mean, again, most of the Lost Galaxy villains never had a redemption arc. Maybe they don't need redemption. They're better off irredeemable. They're better off being killed off for the hell for the hell, for all their evil sins. And I think it's best to keep Drakina irredeemable as well because she's too evil to be redeemed. And I've said this many, many times, no matter how many times I have to talk about the show like a college essay talking about a children's show that had irredeemable villains 25 years ago and what's the point trying to redeem the villains of that show from 25 years ago when they're better off evil because evil forever bad is good bad is better than good and some shit like that but again i didn't even go to college after high school so what's the point but i'm just talking out of this for my own street smarts here so I'm just, just saying it just because because based on my own knowledge of the fact that I've talked about these Power Rangers a lot for the last 25 years, even as a kid and as an adult today, and I just kind of feel like, you know, I think I've talked enough about it. Again, Villamax probably... And just seeing that blow to him by Trakina's sword... That was a very tragic way to lose him, too. We could have got to see him fight alongside the Rangers to face her, but they had other plans. They decided to go ahead and just let her keep going at this acting like a crazy bug bitch and just go run with it. And seeing the green light on Villamax foreshadow Trakina turning green in the next and final episode of the show. Again, more visual foreshadowing. Maybe Trakina should just kill Kegler too because Kegler did nothing. I'm sorry, but now that Kegler doesn't have Villamax to back him up, he's on his own. Or better yet, forget about him because he was forgettable too. 
I mean, what was the? That's the problem with Lost Galaxy is that we had all these damn different villains, and we had some of them that didn't even really do nothing. Of all the times I ragged about how Scorpius was some hentai-looking monster on a foam rock or whatever, and he only did one thing in 21 episodes of 45 he was in, and that was that. And if you thought losing Villamax was rough, losing the Centaurus and Stratoforce Megazords was rough, look no further to the original Astro Mega ship. Yeah, we waited two seasons until Power since this season, since we saw this first in the very first episode of Power Rangers in Space, only to see this ship crushed by a bug woman from this season. Now, astronomer well, again, since Corona is here, even if she had if she had gone through another astronomer flashback, this would have been something she could have done. And now that Corona is the Pink Ranger here. She's glad she ain't going through what she did when she was astronomer because when she was astronomer, she could have did this with Andros and, and his rangers and when she almost hurt her, almost killed her own brother and his team back then. But now that she's a ranger this season, it's even worse. Like seeing the Astro Mega ship, which was a ship that her brother had flown around the whole time last season and now she's on the ship with the team of rangers she's with currently. And this is even sadder for her case. But with Leo and the, the gang, since they're brand new to the franchise at this point, because these guys were brand new characters back then, losing the mega ship, I think to them, it's like how TJ and the t team had to lose the Turbo and Rescue Megazords back in Turbo's finale. And yeah, and Damon being stubborn that he just don't want to leave the mega ship because the ship is about to go. Trakina is crushing them. She's about to kill them no matter what chance she has. And once they get to the Jet Jammers, it's game over. And they once they do try to get out of the mega ship on the Jet Jammers, one of them is about to, one of them is not going to make it with them to the new world. And the others have made it. And it's just only one that made it to the moon with her instead. And, and I, I see this is one of the reasons why I kind of feel like finales like this of Power Rangers really knows how to raise stakes because this is one of the few things I did bitch and complain about for the last decade with the Neo Saban era and one of the things that it was lacking because they didn't want to do high stake finales anymore sure yeah 10 years ago with Super Mega Force we had the legendary battle and they couldn't even do a high stake finale like this if they wanted to pay tribute to Countdown to Destruction in a really shoddy way they should have did it that way but and raised the stakes with Emperor Mavro and the Armada and then also the Mega Force Rangers would go all out in the big battle and did some high stakes stuff that way with those zords and every other power up against Mavro but you know how it is with Neo Saban and how those finales was but okay but I understand but back then that was me as a Power Rangers fan from 2014 to 2019 this is 2024 and we don't have a new season. So looking back on an older season from 25 years ago, whom I've tried to make a fan film of proper with these characters, these staple characters and try and, and also take the same female bug villain proper and try to do something different from what I've known for 25 years and try to twist it over its head, but trying to stay true and faithful to what has come before. Even when I do put that film up in two days, who would have thought that after 25 years since the show aired, that I would make a movie about these Rangers. But I know that my 2014 efforts sucked. And of all the lambasted harassment and criticism that I received back in the day, and despite all the, you know, again, the bullying and harassment I had for that project. And who would, and, and, you know, again, I could have, uh, did things right back in 2014 with that, but instead of doing what I did back in the day. Well, don't worry. We'll see Alpha again in Once a Ranger, but I think Part 2 is the last time we're going to see Alpha uh, for now until Once a Ranger in Operation Overdrive. In fact, it was the last time. This was the last time we'll see him. And seeing Kai's hair like that makes him look like Nathan Drake from Uncharted again. Jesus, seeing Leo's jet jammer was, tr you know, trashed onto the moon. And this is the same moon location we'll see later on in Forever Red. Wow, foreshadowing three seasons down the line of that of Power Rangers.
Yeah, until forever red, folks. While they did feature Trakina going close to the cocoon to a to be continued bit for the cliffhanger, the next episode picks up the same footage immediately from this, but in, but inserting Scorpius into the shots, reflecting back to what he told her back in Stolen Beauty about her using the cocoon at some point. So yeah, we're now into the end game, folks. She, Trakina may be inevitable, but the Power Rangers will always win into victory. I know, Avengers Endgame reference. Okay, so here we are. Part 3 of Journey's End. And so we've come so far since the show began. And we've come so far since Power Rangers had its debut in the 1990s. Especially in the early 90s. And with this being the, the epilogue of that era, epilogue of everything that has come to pass and what's yet to come for Power Rangers of the 21st century. So yeah, part three of Journey's End, final episode of Power Rangers that aired during the 1990s and the close out the 20th century. So let's get on with it. So recapping from what happened in part two with Trakina uh, being brutally injured and scarred, you know, or let's just say marred in the face. Uh, from the explosion between her ship and the Astro Omega ship. And the way how they put detail to her face with that scar, it, it go to show, yeah, it, she has had enough. It was time for her to shed all of that more, more mortal beauty that she had um, and go into something more grotesque, which another thing that we never saw coming either is, you know, for those who were kids at the time watching Power Rangers and with her mutating into the cocoon, becoming something more gross as we see and with all that green slime coming out it goes to show that she jesus it's just really nasty with that green slime it's just disgusting it looks like pure mucus and you know again it was time that this was the episode that where everything needed to come full circle because technically like i've been saying ever since even the 20th anniversary of the of the series back in 2019 that ever since avengers endgame that if in space was power rangers infinity war um back in 1998 with the uh, mass invasion for the earth and everything and zordon sacrifice by the end this season and its finale was technically Avengers Endgame for Power Rangers because then again, Lost Galaxy does serve as an epilogue to what has come before because Lightspeed Rescue would be completely independent going forward, but we will still have continuity and nods to past series and every once in a while, but Lost Galaxy will be the last time that Power Rangers would carry on some stuff from past seasons while trying to do its own thing. So it was also a transitionary season because it was trying to do completely new stuff, but then when you have to harken back to uh, all of the past elements and past characters, some for some of them, um, it's really like you really have to realize that we've really needed to move forward because I know that when they were trying to do that, bringing bulk and phenomenas back when. Knowing a lot of Laps fans had long moved on from the franchise at this point, and most people just stopped caring about Power Rangers, even no matter what season it is. But people are still going to talk about Mighty Morphin and how iconic it was. But personally, I'll never stop talking about how dark but yet brilliantly and creative Lost Galaxy was, and even in space. Because when you have your two space operas uh, versus a three year superhero sitcom, say by the Bell meets Ninja Turtles uh, for early 90s PR. I mean, yeah, of course, early 90s PR will probably trump anything that comes after because people's nostalgia for it. But my nostalgia is Power Rangers when it started getting more dramatic, cinematic in places, sort of, even on a TV budget. And they were also taking risk at doing things that Mighty Morphin never got to do at the time. Then again, Trakina, this was all your mess. You wrecked the ship. You got what you wanted. Now you want to destroy what's left of the colony. And Jesus, seeing Trakina in that green, covered in green goo when she mutated, it's 
rather a really disturbing, mutated uh, way to look at her. But, you know, again, I understand that the, from a writing perspective, you need to make her become a mutant mutant insect like her father is because, well, then again, we never really got to see what Scorpius looked like prior to his mutated state. But we've all already have seen Trakina in her human form and also her villainous bug human hybrid form before going into the mutated form, which, yeah... It just makes sense that they just don't, you know, they did very great, great job on expanding on Trakina's character in the series, what, what they could at the time, but they just never expanded on the overall origins of the villains enough. I mean, yeah, I understand they didn't have the budget, but, you know, to do all of that great altruistic stuff. But I don't know down the line if Boom Studios will continue doing any further Power Ranger series uh, for future comic endeavors and expand on stuff from past seasons, especially this one where there's a lot of stuff that needs to be fully expanded. Like, where did the ga Lost Galaxy powers come from? Who put the Quasar Sabers in the stone and all of that? But unfortunately, we'll never see that. Now that the main universe had folded thanks to Cosmic Fury. And that Jonathan Entwistle reboot that was supposed to happen got scrapped. And we're, we were left in the dark all 2024. Hell, I was even left in the dark and the green, literally seeing in the scene where in five minutes and 57 seconds, Leo's already in the control, pan, the control room of, the, of Terra Venture and he sees Trakina's staff and... Yep, and I figured the whole Trakina stalking Leo stuff, that's exactly what I did for Power Rangers Lost Galaxy 2024. Yeah, there is no Fatal Attraction-like stuff here in the main universe. That's only my fan thing. I mean, this is typical alien predator meets whatever with Power Rangers with uh, Alien Bug Woman versus Red Ranger, who, whom she had a long vendetta against ever since she became appointed as main villain for the rest of the series. And with all this green lighting and everything, this was, you know, technically like this t kind of stuff. I figured this is where Ang Lee got his idea with all that green light foreshadowing stuff for his Hulk movie in 2003. Kind of. We'll remember this whole Leo falling out of a building thing come Trakina's Revenge because there is a lot of stuff this finale had to, uh, you know, set a seed for for Lightspeed Rescue's team up with this team. Because, again, Lost Galaxy, I've talked about for a long time and how much I loved it as a kid. But then you go into Lightspeed Rescue, and I just felt like something was missing. Especially, you got to Trakina's Revenge. But previously, as that VHS thing at McDonald's before it would air months into TV broadcasting. And I was just so, like, against the idea of them hearkening back to... Um, this finale but yeah Trakina had some unfinished business with the Rangers and so does she thought but even though as we get to the end when Leo pulls out the battleizer how the heck does she manage to survive maybe her bug forms made her stay alive so she wasn't really dead like there's that theory like her mutant form really kept her alive for at least one more season and at least one more time we will see her again even if it's not her original actress playing her next season look I get it Trakina you want to kill the Red Ranger because he killed your father get over it alright even though, again, final episode of the season, it's just she needed to get her revenge against him over with. And, and she was close to killing him, too, before the others would come and come to his aid and rescue. And I saw it in the thing. Leo had his jet jammer trash. Maya gets her jammer trash, too. Damn. You know, here's something I would have rewrote from the finale as, as much as I still like it for what it is, this final episode and final battle between her for, for what it was. Now, I wish that if, you know, again, back in part two, if Villamax didn't get killed by Trakina, he could have helped the Rangers fight her and try to stop her from going all berserk, even if she's not psychotic with the Deviat stuff anymore. Even in her mutant form, she's crazy and knocking Damon around. Wow, what a freaking bug-headed Karen. That Trakina is. She's so racist. But not only that, um, 
I just think that they could have did this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I would have liked it if Trakina was still in her deviat form to fight the Rangers. We, you know, that was a missed opportunity. I actually thought her fighting fighting against the Rangers in her deviat form would have been cool, but we saw how formidable she was when she crushed the Rangers in the Astro Mega Ship almost and destroyed Terra Venture. Then Kamikaze the entire colony with her Suicide Squad, literally Suicide Squad bombed Stingwingers, and all that missed opportunity and hell another missed opportunity even with the final battle with Trakina had if Mike never lost the Magda Defender powers and sacrificed that in Toro Zord he could have helped the Rangers fight against her even if they didn't need to use the likes of Orion okay well then looking back on Trakina's revenge okay I can see why the Rangers didn't use the likes of Orion on her initially in this episode and closing out their series before until we will ever see them again next season and okay it makes sense not to use the likes of Orion on her because we may never know how much power her mutant powers would possess compared to their powers in general because even her even in her mutant bug form Trakina is sort of powerful in ways she, she, she was zapping you know green energy bolts at the rangers a bunch of times then used a vine whip like something catwoman would use on batman here and there and would you know whip the red ranger around and knock him to a uh drywall and we saw that And wow, watching this episode in 20 minutes time without commercials, you can tell this finale, this final episode and final battle went by pretty quick. Oh, right, right in the bug tits. Okay, now we know here's the real story reason why this battleizer was used. The ultimate moment, the end game. No Infinity Stones, you know, necessary because, of course, this is not Marvel. Yeah, Power Rangers did this Avengers Endgame thing first without any additional Rangers to back up the Galaxy Rangers. But the real reason they made this Battleizer for Leo is to blow up Trakina as a su last-ditch suicide effort. And there was a reason why they came up with this battleizer, and I guess there is the real reason is to blow her up. So this was their Thanos and Iron Man moment from Endgame 20 years earlier. So when Trakina says, what's it going to be? And then Leo is like, this, fire! And then boom! So... Trakina is gone. Frankly not. Well, as we shall see later next season in that team. The Rangers thought that Leo died. And again, this was, you know, this was a cop out. Now, I know that this could have been an opportunity where like, oh man, we already lost Kendrick's bad enough. You mean to tell me we're going to lose this season's Red Ranger too? Oh no, Leo actually survived and there's the iconic broken visor moment. Hey guys, I survived. Yeah, that was a dumb stun I pulled, but I blew her up. <sighs> yeah, Leo, don't do stupid stunts like that again. Yeah, you may say that will be the last time you'll ever see Trakina, but again, next season's team up. You know, they, they really did pull that cop-out moment of Leo using the Battleizer to blow up Trakina, but, you know, they almost nearly pulled the whole Leo should die as the last Ranger to die in the series, and no, because th this team needs its Red Ranger, so he can't die. Now, Trakina was this close to being killed, but, you know, again, like I said, the mutant form saved her, so that's why they brought her back for the team up with Lightspeed Rescue. And this is the last bit we'll see the Galaxy Megazord in American footage, too. And CGI is not all that great, but take it if you will. Farewell, Terra Venture. Thank you for flowing around with us in space for 45 episodes for a whole year of 1999. You'll be dearly missed.
And seeing these shots of that, these palm trees and that island just makes me think about that island they shot for the for the island of Neanthoris or whatever uh, in the Power Rangers Turbo movie sometimes. Also, I have to mark some final farewells with two actors who had their final appearance in Power Rangers. Well, two older actors who had sadly passed away years after the season. Yes, this was Jack, you know, uh, this was Jack Banning, who was Professor Phenomenus for this in the last season. This was his final episode of Power Rangers until his passing in 2005 or 2006. And as for the actors who played um, High Council Rainier, um, Betty Hawkins, I had no idea that she died in 2017. So rest in peace, High Council Rainier. Thank you for helping, you know, thank you for being there when you, when they needed y'all and thank you for uh, being somewhat a quasi mother figure to Damon too. Yeah. And Corone got to reunite with Bulk and Phenomenus too. So another nod to last season since after a Corone was astronomer last season. It's evident. It's no surprise where the Rangers ended up as we, as they follow the Galactic Beast to the forest, Maya and Leo. And after all, Maya and Leo had some focus. After all, they were stowaways on Terra Venture. And here they are. And it seems like everything has to come full circle to where they started and how it all ends. You know, Back when I, I saw this final episode of Lost of Galaxy when as it aired as a kid on December the 18th of 1999, I think looking at this ending and looking at how everything had come to a close, I kind of feel like this probably is where Power Rangers should have ended. But since Lost of Galaxy was successful enough toy wise, you know, toy sale wise, while ratings for the second half was, well, stumbled because of Saban promoting Digimon over this half. And no, no matter how great this half of the series was, and this is when the show was at its strongest. I mean, it was successful enough to greenlit another season and we got Lightspeed Rescue. But here, this is where I feel even when we look at Maya looking back on Jera's statue and also the mirror annoying still in the stone since the show began. And then when she pulls the Quasar Sabers out and after defeating the forces of evil and everything, yes, ever since Furio and then Trakina being the last, last um, force of evil they faced, final boss at that. Technically, this, te this should have been the end of Power Rangers. And I've said this back in my podcast um, back in 2022 in the beginning where I, I felt like due to this finale, due to this last moment, due to them putting the sabers back, restoring Maya's people, this should have been the last episode of Power Rangers for me. And, you know, I've been saying this for a long time and hell, even at this date, my quest of being a fan, doing my thing of Lost Galaxy is kind of complete. Given my recent life event change and everything else that happened. And, well, yeah, it had if this was the last Power Rangers episode I watched. And if Lightspeed Rescue didn't happen, I probably would have been a much happier older kid at 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. 11, 12 and stuff. And I've said about how in my What If I Stopped Watching Power Rangers video back in... 2022 if you go back and listen to that recording uh episode i kind of wish that after the season this is where i probably should have stopped watching power rangers because i felt that for you know as great as lost galaxy was i kind of feel like anything that came f that came after probably wouldn't be all that great when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so forth, and then how my teen years and everything would play out the same, my adult years even currently the same, but I did stay on to watch a couple more of Power Rangers uh, when the show was still on Fox Kids, and up until Wild Force, and, and even when Wild Force did move completely to ABC Family for the remainder of its half of the show in late 2002, and heck, I think Wild Force probably should have been the last season of Power Rangers, but I think Lost, well, there have been times, you know, again, you know, it's crazy how 30 years of Power Rangers, or actually 31 now as of 2024, I kind of feel like the show had multiple intended endings, 
But then it kept on going. Oh, and then rest in peace to the actor who played Jera. His final appearance in Power Rangers also, as to date. Um, yeah, and everything's all happy and dandy and sappy. And, you know, you can't end the show on a downer because... Oh, shit. Yeah, you know, what's another cop out? Kendrick's is back for some reason. Yeah, I know. The leukemia... You know, she's leukemia free. Yeah, I know. And uh, I don't even want to go there with that Dino Fury uh, Master Green thing about her being responsible for bringing Kendricks back because it's one of the possible reasons that she did come back. But again, we would not see the Master Mor- Mor- Morphin Masters again until like, um, yeah, Dino Fury, Cosmic Fury. But um, yeah, Kendricks is back because, well, shut up, I guess. Yeah, we can't end the season without the original Pink Galaxy Ranger. And with Kendrick's back, like, her death meant nothing anymore now. And now Ke- Corona is left useless. Well, she'll be back in Legendary Battle uh, in Super Mega Force 15 years down the pipeline. Yeah, happy ending for everybody. And had if this was the last time I would watch Power Rangers as a kid at this point, this would have been a great happy ending for the series. But the show continued on throughout the 21st century, starting with next season going forward until Cosmic Fury. And so, everybody, that's Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. And that's it for my fan commentaries on Lost Galaxy for now. Because honestly, I don't think I want to commentate on any more episodes of the season. I think I only wanted to commentate on what were the more important episodes of the show. And, um... I think it was just for the best. And uh, I would like to thank you guys for listening to my commentary tracks for uh, Lost in Galaxy and for the 25th anniversary. And uh, until 2025, folks, whenever I come back for any more commentary tracks for other Power Rangers episodes, since we don't have a current show at the moment. But until then, everybody, thank you for listening for my commentary tracks on Lost in Galaxy and on to other seasons that's not it anymore. But until then, everybody, until 2029 and the 30th anniversary, go Galactic!